Who thought it was a great idea for the backdrop giving this speech to say lowering costs, tackling inflation, tackling inflation, lowering costs. Really? Someone thought that that was a good idea. It's it's a joke, right? This is just a bunch of crazy propaganda manipulation hypnotizing for you. President one on one. You're watching him as you're surrounded by what, Everything that he's doing. Yeah. Surprised they didn't put a halo up there above his head. He's lowering costs and tackling inflation. Has to be. So when you think about him, that's what you think about, lowering costs and tackling inflation. We look at the economy today. It's clear we've made enormous strides. And uh, our plans and our policies have produced uh, the strongest job creation economy in modern times. In addition, 8.3 million jobs in my first 15 months in office at a record. Unemployment rates were down to 3.6 percent, the fastest decline in unemployment to uh, to start a presidential term you know, ever recorded. And uh, in addition, Americans uh, have applied to start uh, three or 5.4 million new small businesses last year, 20 percent more than any other year on record. I went. Uh, I want every American okay. to know. That so that one, I did have to look that up. 5.4 million new businesses last year. It's like most, 20% more than a year on record. Also in 2020, we lost 10 million small businesses at least. Okay, those were the most common numbers. Yeah, after you that forced I found. everyone out of their job yeah. and closed a bunch of businesses yeah. down. So these new small businesses, or are we just getting back half of the ones that we destroyed during the pandemic? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's an important question. And I'm taking inflation uh, very seriously, and it's my top domestic priority. I want us to be crystal clear about the problem. There are two leading causes of inflation we're seeing today. The first cause of inflation is a once in a century pandemic. Not only did it shut down our global economy, it threw the supply chains and demand completely out of whack. And this year we have a second cause. A second. Now, I don't know if you know this, but. Um, and the scientists warned about this when they were first studying COVID <clears throat> after they created it. They were uh, looking through and they're like, you know, this does have a pretty low mortality rate. But we've seen, through, look at this strain. Look at the, sir, could you come over and look in this microscope real quick? Um, we look in here. You see that little spike right there? That is the one uh, that destroys the economy. That's specifically the supply chain. Yeah, it attaches itself onto the supply chain. Yeah. <laughs> And it destroys the supply chain. Yeah. And so, it, you know. It's not a protein spike. Very dangerous. That's and, they sh- you know, and I w- if the supply chain wasn't so damn anti-vax, then it could have prevented COVID from infecting its supply chain and mm-hmm. taking it down. But, well, what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine. You saw, we saw in March that 60% of inflation that month was due to price increases at the pump. Putin's war has raised food prices as well, because Ukraine and Russia, two of the world's major breadbaskets for wheat and corn, are essentially completely stalled. Ukraine has 20, 20 million tons of grain in storage and silos right now. They're trying to figure out how to get out of the country to market, which will reduce prices around the world. Normally, Normally, we'd have already begun to export them into the market. So we're working with our European partners to get this food out into the world so they could help bring down prices. Now, that's a weird one right there. Never heard this before. He's saying that if you were to increase the supply, that the prices would go down. Mm. That's weird. Now, what I, what I would say that he should do is just set a cap on the price of wheat and corn, you know? Rather than trying to increase increase the supply. Yeah, I don't know why they're trying to. learned that supply and demand doesn't really an effect anymore. No, no, it's no. It's about price gouging and price control. It's, you know, and my, my family's part of it. They're, uh, they're price gouging everyone with the price that they're selling yeah. their uh, wheat and corn for. And the, the, the commodities, mar- the futures markets. I mean, my dad's uh, and my brother, they've, they've sold futures contracts on their corn and their wheat and everything. And, they're, um, and that's because of Trump. Uh, because of those uh, commodities. Yeah, I don't know why. I'm pretty pissed that the that the House of Representatives is not working on the Consumer Wheat and Corn Price Gouging Prevention Act. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If they just had that, 
the problem would be solved and we probably wouldn't even need Biden to give this whole speech. And now, <laughs> yeah, we, we've got plenty more stuff to, uh, to go through, but he listed out two causes of inflation. Number one was the coronavirus. We talked about what the uh, scientists said about that. Number two was Putin's war. I can't think of anything else. Honestly, yeah. pandemic nothing. and Putin, as Milton Friedman used to say, it's the two in, P's of inflation. <laughs> Friedman used to, pan, Putin pandemic, exactly yeah. as Friedman used to say, inflation is always a a coronavirus phenomenon. <laughs> you know, that's what he's always said. Yeah. So Americans have two potential to pass forward. The first is my plan, the Democratic plan, the plan put forward by congressional Republicans as a second alternative. My plan is to lower employer and lower everyday costs for everyday costs for hardworking Americans and lower the deficit by asking large corporations and the wealthiest Americans to not engage in price gouging and to pay their fair share in taxes. The Republican plan is to increase taxes on the middle class families, let billionaires and large companies off the hook as they raise profits and raise prices and reap profits in record number record amounts. And it's really that simple. Let me start with the Putin price hike. All right, it's that simple. It is that simple. Mm -hmm. He wants to lower prices by making sure that corporations pay their fair share and that corporations are not price gouging. Now, a few seconds ago, I cut out some mumbling and stuff in between. And I left a proper amount of mumbling, don't worry. But uh, I cut out a little bit in between. You know, first thing, we got to make sure we increase the supply because that's causing prices to go up a bunch. Second thing, we got to make sure uh, that we get rid of all the price gouging because this is purely just corporations raising their prices for no reason. Mm -hmm. All of this in the same speech. And then also what he just said, which is going to become very important here in a bit, his plans, of course, going to lower prices for everyone. The Republican plan, what they want to do is raise taxes on poor people and working people, which I didn't realize was part of their plan. So I had to look it up and we'll talk about it here in a little bit. My plan is already in motion. I led the world and ain't that the truth his plans already in motion other countries to be joined with us to coordinate the largest release of oil from our stockpiles of all the countries in history 240 million barrels to boost global supply here at home u.s oil and gas production is it's weird he's talking about supply levels mm -hmm. in fact we produce more oil domestically in my first year in office than my predecessor did in his first year he said this a bunch. I produced more oil in my first year in office than my predecessor did in his first year. Oh, I miss him. Oh, isn't that weird? It's almost like um, your predecessor's first year, he came into the policies of his predecessor and how much drilling they were doing. And then when he when Biden came into office, he came in under the drilling policies of his predecessor. I feel like it's important, but I don't know. But, well, and then you can take the victory of the, of yeah. the predecessor and, by, and the blame on your predecessor for the things that don't work out for you. By the way, Amanda's cracking me up with the tie thing. Just so everyone knows, he's wearing a terrible tie for camera, okay? You're not supposed to wear really tight patterns on cameras, okay? No, no dotted patterns, nothing real tight like that. Cameras don't like it, all right? So I just want to let everyone know that's watching. Imagine a really terrible tie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That if we pass the investments I'm talking about, we'll immediately lower families' utility bills by as much as $500 a year, according to their one estimate. That's by the way, they're going to make their homes more secure in terms of heat not getting out and air conditioning not escaping because they have, they have good insulation. <laughs> and that's by the way, pass the investment. He says that his plan is going to lower prices. That's according to one estimate. <laughs> I got to listen to him talk about why again real quick. That's what I'm talking about. We'll immediately lower families' utility bills by as much as $500 a year, according to their one estimate. That's by the way, they're going to make their homes more secure in terms of heat not getting out and air conditioning not escaping because they have, they have good insulation. <laughs> The next thing is let's compare our plans when it comes to lowering everything. This is a costs. good installation. My plan is to make concrete, common sense steps to bring down the biggest expenses that families are facing. 
Let's take drug prices. My plan will let Medicare negotiate prices for prescription drugs, like they do with the uh, with, with, with the Department of uh, uh, with the military as it relates to what the administration is able to negotiate for prices for military. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about right there. He's either talking about how they negotiate prices for uh, military contracts for like ships and planes and stuff, or he's talking about the VA. Neither one of those are an example that you should be using. No, or Medicare. Or, or Medi- contract, any of them. Yeah, contract negotiations. What, which one of those would be a good example? You know, we can do it like we contract for uh, so for the, the department of uh, for the military. I don't know which department has the military really at all. But um, they report to me. <laughs> did, um, I'm their superior, but the, I don't remember. It's the Department of Offense for sure. <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, neither we one of those. Department of Offense, Department of Defense, <laughs> one of them. <laughs> We're going to send one of them in. So I'm going to send my defensive coordinator in there and <laughs> go negotiate prices. Department and of, home uh, run. Uh, with the military as it relates to what the administration is able to negotiate for prices for military. And I, I also call for a cap on the price of insulin at $35 a month instead of the average price of about $640 a month. And that's in addition to the work my administration has already done to lower prices. <laughs> no, a lot of good stuff to lower prices. Let me tell you what. Yeah, Not supply. What he was doing. He was doing no. certain things. <laughs> These things need caps. I'm, before We need to just, like, so you have to rely on my administration to decide when supply is necessary and when caps are necessary. <laughs> the Ministry of Supply and Demand. The, exactly. They're the ones that come in and decide this. No, the Ministry of Supply and Caps. <laughs> Not, caps. There's no demand, Nate. The the, supply okay. or caps. The Ministry of Caps and Stimulus is, mm-hmm. is what it is. Okay, um, what did he just say? Insulin prices, 35 instead of $642 of the on average right now. Um, okay, they're not actually capping the cost of insulin, just so everyone knows the cost. It's still going to be whatever the cost is. The difference is they're going to force your insurance company to cover all of it, and your out-of-pocket cost, the cap would be $35. So what that will equal, clearly. Now, I'm just, okay, fine. I'll speculate and be a conspiracy theorist here because we've never seen this before. Higher insurance prices. That's what you're going to get right there. Uh, if people are paying that out of pocket and you're going to cap it at 35, they're going to get that money out of the premiums on your insurance. And all that does is spiral up the cost of insurance and make more people in favor of Medicare for all. But I don't know. I'm just a podcast co-host. Okay. Another problem we face is in some industries, it's just, there isn't enough competition. And I've often said that capitalism without competition isn't capitalism. It's exploitation. So we're promoting competition for everything from uh, internet services to meat processing. When there's no competition, they can set the price higher and higher. So we're helping smaller companies get into the game to compete and help bring down the overall prices. Okay. Weird. Competition Mm -hmm. is very important in capitalism. Yeah. It is. I actually don't, I didn't really disagree with any of that. Except for one. Okay. So the principle he lays out is that more competition equals lower prices. Okay, here's the problem. They're going to help other businesses get in there and compete. They're, they're going to subsidize. Okay. That's, yeah, I, yeah that and, is a problem. And how are they going to do that? They're going to give those people money to try and get in there and compete. Whose money are they going to give them? Yours. Your money. And it's in an, an effort to lower prices for you because you're paying probably about 1% too much on whatever your insurance is or your uh, internet service provider is charging you. And so we're going to put... Uh, several billion dollars into creating more competition of your money. You'll pay for that, but you might have more competition and it'll look like we did something. Yeah. Genius. It's like, dude, if you, if you give me a hundred dollars a month, I'll give you Netflix for free. <laughs> That's a pretty good idea. Yeah. Free, I'm going to do doesn't that. want free Netflix. I, listen, why wouldn't you want, who want Netflix is free. You pay Amazon 140 bucks a year. And they give you free shipping. Mm -hmm. Can't argue with that. Can't. (laughs) And what's the Congressional Republican plan? They don't want to solve inflation by lowering your costs. 
They want to solve it by raising your taxes and lowering your income. I happen to think it's a good thing when American families have a little more money in their pockets at the end of the month. Wait, I thought- Except I thought the New York <laughs> Times told us that tax breaks would would increase the rampant inflation. So why would we want to give people more money in their pocket? I'm not confused. <laughs> or no, they're I, I'm confused. No, I don't know what it is actually. You don't even know whether or not you're confused. Mm-mm. My confusion meter is broken. Let's be clear. We have no idea. <laughs> okay. Do we trust Biden or the New York Times? I don't know. But the New York Times, they were just quoting someone from the Obama administration. This is a good one <laughs> Which for that. Biden was- <laughs> yes. <laughs> They were. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good one for that meme where you don't know which button to press. Yeah. Like, <laughs> keep put, keep more money in the pockets of families or tax breaks will cause inflation. They don't know which one. It depends on who you're talking to. But the Republicans in Congress don't seem to think so. Their plan has actually made working families going to make working families poor. You don't have to take my word for it. It's in writing. They've made their intentions perfectly clear. Senator Rick Scott, Wisconsin, a member of the Senate Republican leadership, laid it all out in a plan. It's the ultra mega agenda. Their plan is to raise taxes on 75 million American families, over 95 percent of whom make less than $100,000 a year total income. The average tax increase would be about $1,500 per family. Pause. I thought we were against tax cuts. So well, why, why wouldn't the Democrats be praising a tax increase from the Republicans? I mean, finally, the Republicans have joined us in raising taxes. But you got to lower taxes for your voting base. That's the problem. And the, this Republican tax plan, this widespread adopted insane Republican tax plan. Ultra MAGA. Ultra MAGA, MAGA tax plan would, um, would raise taxes for everyone. By the way, we'll talk about the plan here in a minute. It wouldn't raise, it's not going to touch the tax rate. And it would actually just require that you, uh, basically it would take away people getting the child tax credit and actually receiving money at the end of the year from the government. It requires that everyone pays at least $1 in taxes. So what people don't get paid out by the government through the child tax credit, they are counting as raising your taxes in this conversation. At the moment. Okay. But that's not even the whole part of the story. I proposed a minimum tax for billionaires. In recent years, the average billionaire has paid about 8% in federal taxes. Congressional Republicans have proposed increasing taxes on teachers and firefighters. <laughs> 55. <laughs> that's what it was, by the way. The billionaires, they paid 8%. The congressional Republicans, they have thrown out a proposal to increase taxes on teachers and firefighters. It's called the... It's called the uh, Teachers and Firefighters Bill. That's actually what it was called. (laughs) And they threw that out there the other day. The official name. Yeah. 5% of the largest corporations paid net zero in federal taxes in 2020 on $40 million profits. It just isn't right. That's why I proposed a minimum tax for corporations. Think about it. Republicans in Congress are so deeply committed to protecting big corporations and CEOs that they'd rather see taxes on working American families and try to depress their wages to take on inflation. You want to bring down inflation? Let's make sure the wealthiest corporations pay their fair share. My plan, ask those companies to pay their fair share in taxes. It's like he's running for president again. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Vote for me because my plan does this. That is a lot what it sounds like. It says you want to bring down inflation. We need to raise taxes on the people that you get every single thing from. That is how we bring down inflation. That will lower prices. Boom. For sure. Nailed it. You want your prices to go down. We are going to raise expenses on the people who provide every single thing that you use on a daily basis. That is my plan. Personal Republican plan? Let them off scot-free. And if you weren't extreme enough in the Congressional Republican agenda, they put it in writing. It also calls on Congress to put special, excuse me, put Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid on the chopping block every five years. 
Now, if I hadn't seen it in writing, I think somebody's making this up. But their proposal is every five years, all those programs would cease unless they're re-voted, that the Congress comes along and says, yeah, we want to keep these plans, affirmatively voting for them. Well, imagine the change that's going to take place then, man. Imagine all the bargaining that's going to take place. You Democrats want to maintain Social Security, you got to give up such and such. Republicans kind of want to make, and Congress want to make Medicare's very existence <laughs> up for vote. You Democrats want to maintain Social Security, you got to give up such and such. Now, the plan, which we'll talk about here in a second, um, it puts Medicare and Social Security on the chopping, it sunsets it every five years, they got to vote on it again. It says, imagine the changes. Imagine the changes that would take place then, you know, every time that you want to re-up Medicare and Social Security, they got to say, oh, you got to give up this thing. I don't know. That actually does kind of sound like a good plan to me. <laughs> but Sounds like a great plan. Yeah, that does sound like a plan. Um, all right, let's let's hear some more. Republicans kind of want to make, and Congress want to make Medicare's very existence <laughs> up for vote over and over again. How well are we going to sleep at night? knowing that every five years, MAGA Republicans, if they're still the Republican, this, as I said, this is not your father's Republican Party, if we're going to have to vote on whether you will have Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what amounts you'll have in each of those programs. I can't believe that the majority of Republicans buy on to Scott's plan, but that's a plan in writing, and he's in the leadership. Well, there's a reason why, Biden. We don't have any money. Yeah. Now he just said, I can't believe now, whatever, here's one thing I'm going to do. I always do the, the, the diction thing, a captioning thing for the videos. I'm going to leave whatever the thing ends up captioning on there. <laughs> Cause uh, I can't believe is a majority of Republicans by honest God's plan. <laughs> I think it's going to be great. I'm going to go with whatever it says. He's, earlier he said, imagine all the bargaining that's going to take place, but it sounded like he said, imagine all the blogging that's going to take place. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just going to go with it, whatever it comes out with. Okay, so the majority of Republicans, that's an important thing to remember, too. Let's compare our two plans when it comes to the deficit. Republicans love to attack me as a big spender, as if that's the reason why inflation's gone up. Let's compare the facts. Under my predecessor, the deficit exploded. Under my plan, we're on track to cut the federal deficit by one $1.5 $1.5 trillion this year. Let me say it again. $1.5 trillion by the end of this fiscal year. The biggest one-year decline in all of history. <laughs> now, because does, it was the biggest deficit in history. Doesn't that just sound, like, when you hear that, doesn't that just sound crazy? $1.5 trillion cut? Wow. That is, how is that even possible? Wow. It's almost like we had a... a a $2.2 trillion bill that went through that they paid for and, and dished it all out really quickly. And then he, by the way, wanted to do a $3 trillion bill mm -hmm. and didn't survive, didn't make it. They broke it up into a couple other ones. They got a $1.9 trillion bill that people won't vote for. And since they won't vote for it, I'll, get, I'll hand it to them. They're being smart. Now they're talking about how they're lowering the deficit. Okay. They've taken something where they couldn't get a bill passed that was going to be almost as much as the original COVID stimulus. They couldn't get it passed. And so now they're talking about how much they've reduced the deficit since the bill wasn't able to get passed. It's amazing. It's so. And also, I love how you can blame everything on the pandemic mm -hmm. except for this. No, that's true. Like that's they literally, point. the supply chain, inflation, Putin, everything, it's all pandemic's fault. Except. The deficit. The deficit. Under it's Trump. Under Trump, yeah. No, that's yeah. not that's not because of the coronavirus Cong pandemic. Exactly, no. no. Congress didn't pass the, what was the name of the bill? Coronavirus relief aid or what? I don't remember, I don't what, remember it was. what it was. I don't know. Oh. All right, we got uh, a minute left in the video. That's in addition to last year, we cut the budget $350 billion. The deficit, not the budget, the deficit, $350 billion. Because reducing the deficit is one of the main ways we can ease inflationary pressures. Okay, hold on. Did you hear what he just said, Charlie? No, I missed it. Reducing the deficit 
is one of the main ways that we can ease inflationary pressures. What does that mean? Does that mean that more government spending of money that we don't have leads to inflation? Mm. Let me... Not the budget, the deficit, $350 billion. Because reducing the deficit is one of the main ways we can ease inflationary pressures. Americans have a choice. I don't think he was supposed to admit that. Between two paths. My plan attacks inflation and grows the economy. The other path is the ultra MAGA plan to raise taxes on working families, lower the income of American workers, threaten sacred programs Americans count on like Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and give break after break to big corporations and billionaires, just like they did the last time they were in power, when their top priority was the reckless $2 trillion tax cut, which ballooned the deficit and not a penny of it was paid for. Look, I know you got to be frustrated. I know. I can taste it. <laughs> I can taste it. Can... Hold on one more time. It was paid for. Look, I know you got to be frustrated. I know. I can taste it. <laughs> that the, was that the end? Yeah. <laughs> I just had to leave that part uh, in there. Oh, man, that's good. I can taste it. I can taste it. <laughs> this face, dude. <laughs> I can taste it. His eyes got wide. Okay, one more problem oh. that we'll have to add in here with uh, what he was just saying, and then we're done, and we'll get the voting out of the way, uh, is um, from the Washington Post associated with what we just talked about. <clears throat> From the Washington Post, Biden's false claim that congressional Republicans want to raise taxes. This is interesting from, from the, the Washington from Post. From the Washington Post. The facts. In February, Rick Scott released a 60-page, 11-point plan to rescue America that offered 128 proposals. In his introductory letter, he noted that, quote, this plan is not for the faint of heart, that's for sure, buried on page 34 at the end of a long list of ways purported to combat socialism was the idea, quote, all Americans should pay some income tax to have skin in the game, even if it's a small amount. Currently, over half of Americans pay no income tax. Some Republicans... Which is all the billionaires. <laughs> so, <laughs> some Republicans, such as Republican National Committee Chairwoman Ron McDaniel, have broadly praised Scott for delivering a policy document, but... As far as we can tell, this is the WAPO, not a single other Republican in Congress has embraced Scott's specific tax proposal. Politico contacted 27 Republican Senate campaigns asking whether their candidate agreed with Scott's income tax proposal, and none endorsed it. The other four members of the Senate leadership, including McConnell, either directly or implicitly criticized Scott for the plan. McConnell said, we will not have, as part of our agenda, a bill that raises taxes on half of the American people and sunsets Social Security and Medicare within five years. He said that will not be part of a Republican Senate majority agenda. Okay, so that's from the WAPO right but there. This was all Republicans. Yeah, so this is a proposal. But this wasn't even a bill, by the way. It was just a document talking about different policies. And they picked one of them out of there from back in February that... No other Republicans have signed on to or even thought it was a good should. idea. Even though they should. Even though they should, actually. Um, and it's not because of the paying taxes part. The main part in there is that he would get rid of the tax credit that ends up with you getting paid money by the federal government at the end of the year. Even if you have no income. Would even it out at, at the end of the year. But no one signed on to it. And Biden just said in that speech that he couldn't believe that a majority of Republicans were in favor of this. 